Okay, good afternoon. Thanks everybody for being patient. Sorry it took us a little bit to get set up today. Um, hi, my name is Sarah Ladislaw. I'm the Director of the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS. I want to welcome all of you here today for our uh, discussion on sustainable, resilient energy infrastructure. We're going to focus on uh, the, the role of SRI in uh, managing growing urban settings. Um, we, as you'll see from some of our panelists, we've got sort of different definitions of what a city is. So uh, we'll be uh, we'll be talking about this issue across a range of uh, of built infrastructures. Um, we're really excited to have today's session. It's the second in a, a series on global sustainability issues uh, that we are pleased to be sponsoring here with the support of Bechtel, uh, who has made it possible for us to look at sustainability across a range of uh, regional and topical slash functional areas um, that we'll be looking at uh, throughout the course of the year. So. Um, so thanks very much. We're, we're really excited about today's session. It's been something that's been on our minds for a while. Uh, it, for those of you who come to some of our events often, uh, you'll notice uh, some of these folks have been uh, at other workshops or panels that we've had. Um, because really we started to see this focus on the choice between sustainability, both in the built infrastructure and technologies, and also sort of resilience, uh, both to, uh, as we were just talking about at lunch, uh, either cyber attacks or natural, uh, natural uh, 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 disasters or incidents, um, as being a really important part of a discussion that we need to have both about planning and investment. Uh, policies and regulation. Uh, and so we actually think this is a really timely topic and know a lot of you spent uh, some of your time focusing on this, so we're looking forward to a, a good and interesting discussion. We're starting a bit late, so I won't uh, go on too much longer. Um, we're really pleased today, and I'll just give it to you in the order that they're going to be appearing. Um, today we've got Peter Evans here, who's the president for the Center for Global Enterprise. Uh, came to us, uh, we've known Peter for a long time uh, through his work with GE. Uh, and uh, really was one of the first people that I'd had sort of a formative conversation with about uh, sustainable, resilient infrastructure. Uh, so uh, really welcome him here to sort of talk about what that concept is uh, and how we could uh, start thinking about it. Uh, we've got Jan Vrins here, who's the managing director at Navigant. Uh, and Jan uh, is wonderful at sort of explaining the changes that are going on in the technology space, especially on the electric power side, and how that fits into um, both how we're thinking about how sustainable technologies uh, and resilience fit in the market structure that is evolving because of these new technologies and information systems. Uh, and then we've got um, uh, Amos Avedon, who is a senior vice president and manager of engineering and technology with Bechtel. Um, we, when we first started this conversation with Bechtel, you know, uh, we, we wanted them to be on the panel because we know about some of the experience they've had, both in terms of uh, thinking about the technologies that you can bring to bear uh, for managing these two challenges, but also some of the planning that's required. Uh, and so I think that that sort of unique perspective, both on the capacity building and planning side and on technology, is a really unique perspective that they're bringing to the table today. Uh, and finally, David Rogers, who's the senior, senior climate change specialist for climate and chemicals with the Global Environmental Facility, also known as Jeff. Um, David was with us at, a, at a, a previous rollout of Climate Scope, which was a report uh, that was done um, uh, with the collaboration of a number of uh, development banks and Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Uh, and he really sort of talked about, you know, the challenge of getting uh, developing uh, countries uh, to have the resources and to sort of finance that gap. Um, between uh, energy infrastructure that they're considering and, and energy infrastructure that takes into consideration climate risks. And so he'll talk a little bit about the experience that Jeff has had uh, in, in trying to seed some of that financing and build momentum. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Peter, and we'll each, each uh, speaker will have a bit of a presentation, and then we'll have a discussion. So thanks again for being with us. Oh, I'm sorry, one, uh, if I don't do this and we have a disaster at, at a resilience conference, I'll be in big trouble. Um, so it, we don't plan on having any incident today, but if, uh, if we do, uh, the, the evacuation route is pretty uh, simple. It's uh, to the back of the room and out to the front of the building. Uh, you can also, I believe, uh, get out this door, no, that door, sorry, don't, don't listen to me. Uh, that door, uh, that'll uh, leave you in the alleyway in the back of the building and you can uh, get over to M Street. So, um, but. I would recommend if it's not blocked, the one that you know you can see through the glass to get to the entrance. But uh, that's our safety moment. So, Peter, uh, we do we use this? Okay, so just there. I'll take the one for this. Here for you. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. Um, great crowd. Great day. Great panel. 
So what I thought I'd do today is frame this issue up. I've spent a fair amount of time reading through the literature and um, actually had a chance to travel around both to Europe and Asia and talk to a number of uh, officials about this topic. So um, what I'd like to do is be more of a framing. We have a lot of expertise on the panel that can go into each of these items uh, deeper. Uh, so my first slide is to uh, prove that resilience is a big deal. <laughs> There's a lot of reports out there on this topic. Um, these are, I think, largely government related. Uh, the National Academies of Sciences, for example, in the US has done studies. The World Bank has gotten into this topic. Um, some foundations, like the Rockefeller Foundation, have been doing a lot of interesting work in this area. So it is a very rich and diverse literature. Um, and it comes from a variety of different angles. So you'll find the civil engineers have gotten very interested in it, and they have their worldview. The climate folks um, have spent a lot of time on this, or at least have gravitated to this topic. And so they have their literature. You have energy people. You have water people. And so it's a very diverse. Um, and if anybody's interested in getting the, the short version, and, and uh, you can please feel free to come and, and speak to me about it. Um, and I've got uh, a, a fairly sizable database now on the resilience uh, literature. So there's a lot of uh, attention to this topic. It's become a bit of a buzzword, um, but I think it does speak to a growing reality, and that is the impact of shock events. And we can have a variety of types of shocks. You can have political shocks, you can have financial shocks, and then you can have these physical shocks to the system. So resilience really rises out of these uh, physical shocks. So I think a, a first question, and I have a series of questions here that I'll pose to frame the discussion for today, is resilience to what? And as I mentioned, you know, the climate folks are focused on climate related, but one of the biggest impacts to energy infrastructure is actually um, earthquakes. They do a huge amount of damage to systems in Chile, in uh, New Zealand, there was a big earthquake, and obviously the biggest, and this is what really got me into this topic, was the earthquake and tsunami that hit Japan a number of years ago. Um, we know about it largely through the nuclear fallout from that, but it also knocked out a huge amount of fossil fuel generation that was critical to uh, Japan's energy system. So there's a bunch of different types of disruptions that happen. Um, volcanoes actually can be uh, uh, impactful. Flooding is very, very damaging to the energy systems as we saw in Hurricane Sandy was that storm surge that impacted the distribution system and flooded uh, quite a number of the substations. Um, and then you have uh, the storms and then other extreme. Another one that is uh, not as you know, dramatic in its uh, immediate implications but can have huge implications to energy systems are droughts. Uh, we've seen uh, drought events in uh, Brazil have very, very big impacts in California now as well. And wildfires can actually have, uh, so there's a whole range and depending on who's speaking on the topic or writing on the topic, they'll tend to focus on one or another. Um, and then today at lunch, we also, um, so it was Charlie, uh, raised the, the issue of human interventions, right? So you can have terrorist attacks or you can have cyber related effects that also create shock events to the system. So. They're all different. Um, and then you also have another question, which is, who is vulnerable? And there's um, a lot of interesting emerging research in this area. This is a slide that basically takes the United Nations analysis of city-related um, effects of hazards. And what's happening, you know, the megatrend is a concentration of more and more people in urban centers, which is great for culture and economic activity and the vibrancy, but it also concentrates risk. And so this map shows um, whether or not a city has one hazard, two or more hazards, or three or more. And you can see that Asia Pacific has a high degree of vulnerability but lots of other places around the world uh, do as well. And if you've looked at any of the demographic trends, you'll just see the growth of cities uh, being phenomenal. And associated with that, obviously, if you have a lot of people living in a city, that means you have a lot of energy infrastructure uh, sustaining those uh, populations. So um, cities are one way to look at this uh, problem that's getting a lot of attention. But you can also look at regional or very local. So kind of the levels um, of analysis are important. Um, the other is to understand the scope of this, and uh, there's um, 
insurance agency, um, Munich Re, who puts this analysis together every year. And it's pretty dramatic, which is to look at the scope of natural disasters on a global basis. We usually in the news hear about individual events and it's kind of episodic and you hear about it and there's recovery and then you go on. But when you look at the scale of it on a global level, we see that we're now trending over 900 major events a year. Um, and it's uh, all over the map, and it's very uh, diverse in the kinds of disasters that happen. Some of them are drought events, some of them are earthquakes, some of them are uh, storm-related. So it's not just climate, it's also these other types of uh, disruptions that can happen. And the trend line isn't looking so good. Um, back in 1980, you had about 400 of these events a year, and now we're trending over 850. And that's largely due to the fact that the human-built environment has just gotten bigger over the last 30 years. And so there's just a lot more stuff to be hit by these types of shock events. And so it's just part of living on Earth that we live in a you know, uh, an earth that has these perturbations, and so the, the, the environment that we build to live in gets hit by these types of events. And so we're seeing this um, happen and increase, and I think, you know, based on what I've seen, there's not more earthquakes happening. <laughs> it's just that there's more stuff out there for those earthquakes or those storms to be impacted. And so this leads to an interesting um, set of questions about what is uh, the policy imperative for today and going forward around energy. And we've seen over the last two decades a tremendous focus on sustainability, right? How do we get our energy system greener? But as these impact, these shock events become uh, bigger, and particularly when they do things like hit New York City, <laughs> which is, a, is a, both a center for economic activity, but it's also symbolic, right? A lot of people look to New York as the city in the world. I mean, it, it has very important symbolic uh, strength as well. And so when you have a major uh, event in that kind of city, people begin to look and uh, realize we need to think more about how do we protect ourselves against these shock events. And so you get an interesting question from a public policy perspective of do we focus on continuing to focus on reducing uh, carbon emissions and other things to make our energy system cleaner, or do we make it more robust? And it turns out that there's some interesting questions about whether or not these are two goals that are synergistic or are they divergent? And so investment that you make in robustness, does it take away from the sustainability or not? And there's a debate about this. Um, but what's pretty clear is, is that the policy pendulum is beginning to shift to thinking more about uh, the robustness equation. And so the question is, is can we move into the upper um, uh, right-hand corner, which would be resilient, sustainable, i.e., can you combine these things uh, together in a cohesive uh, policy uh, forum? So this leads to the question of what is resilience, and I just put up one definition. There's a lot of definitions out there, um, and that is this ability to bounce back faster from a stress or shock, endure one, or minimize the impact of the stress or shock. And there's a whole range of interesting, diverse solutions that are proposed around diversification, greater intelligence, i.e., how do we use big data and analytics um, to uh, improve the resilience of systems. This relationship between coupling and decoupling, i.e., we have these big centralized systems, how do you get away from them and decouple from them when you have a disaster? Um, and then recouple, because large centralized systems tend to be more efficient um, and get, you get a lot of benefits from being connected. Um, but when those systems go down, how do you de decouple? Uh, pooling and coordination of resources. Um, how do you bring in others that can help you during a disaster? And how do you set those things up um, beforehand? And so there's a lot of interesting things. Utilities from basically all the way into the Midwest help support Con Ed in the recovery. So how do you set those things up in advance and think about them? And then what kinds of levels of redundancy or hardening um, that you want to put into the system? So there's a lot of diverse solutions. And I think it's very early stages as to where we're policy um, focus in kinds of sets of solutions that are thought about. Another is the problem of network linkages. I think that uh, we hear a lot about decentralization of the energy system, but another big trend is the linkages between systems. And what's happening with the advent of shale in the US is two systems that 
had almost nothing to do with each other are now increasingly coming together, and that is the gas network with the transportation network. The transportation network is looking to get the advantages of lower gas, and so these two systems are coming together. What does that mean in terms of the interconnectivity of those? Hurricane Sandy revealed that when you lose electric power, you also can impact your transportation system because gas stations require electricity to pump the fuel up, and so you had a transportation crisis coupled with the electricity crisis. And so are we setting ourselves up by linking natural gas with the transportation network, if something happened to the natural gas system, does that impact the transportation system? And I can go on with other linkages here, but the point is, is that as these complex networks intersect, how do they cascade through the system when a shock event happens and how do you protect against that? Timing is a really interesting and challenging and problematic question, which is where do you uh, invest in resilience along a continuum? And that is you have the mitigation of risk, that is before the event happens, then you have the disaster itself and all of the chaos and all the challenges that are associated with figuring out what got damaged, how do we manage that system, and then we have the recovery portion. So we have before, during, and after. And resilience, I think, and if you read the literature, uh, talks about different parts of this. And you have advocates saying we should do more of the front end, well, we should do more on the back end. So thinking through where do you invest in resilience, I think, is a really important um, issue. And then on the back end, what do you recover to? You know, people say, well, we should build a new system that will lead us in a better place in the future. But the brutal reality is, is when you have these shock events, um, people want their systems up, back, and running right away. And so what happens is you tend to rebuild what you already had. And that's what happened again in Hurricane Sandy, is you typically rebuilt the existing system, not the system that people realize would be more resilient or efficient or more sustainable in the future. Um, another question is who pays? and. Um, there's been some really interesting work, and I think uh, the PhD students that worked on it are here today, um, which is following the money, i.e., this is an example of um, a, a, a earthquake that happened in San Francisco in 1989, and it's very interesting to see the patterns of financial flows. That is, which local agencies, which state agencies, which federal agencies provided funding, which um, charities contributed to that, and you see these complex networks of financial flows emerge. And this is, of course, in the United States, which tends to have more resources. Um, these patterns um, are much harder to build, and so in the emerging markets where those institutions are weaker, and so thinking about who pays and how and when is a really important set of uh, questions. And just in the energy space, is it the taxpayer, is it the uh, rate payer, or somebody else in the system uh, is very critical. And then finally, um, I think a really important question is, are we doing enough to spur innovation in resilience? So if you look at various countries and the kinds of programs they put in place to foster innovation, you find the tremendous amount of attention to coming up with the new, latest green technologies, but not a lot on the resilience side. And so the question is, is, is public funding for innovation going to the right places, and will we see a shift? And if we do, where should that investment go? And is there a synergy of achieving both resilience and sustainability at the same time? So to wrap up, um, just to summarize again, um, I think going forward, this interconnection uh, between resilience and sustainability is, is, uh, is what we face in the future for our energy system. Some of the key challenges are timing to incentivize the right allocation of resilience between before, during, and after the shock. Uh, funding, that is figuring out who pays. Um, for resilience because it has a lot of the attributes of a public good, which means that the private sector tends to underinvest in resilience. And then finally, are we doing enough to spur innovation in this space? And if so, um, what kind of innovation would make sense? Thanks. Okay, well, while we get Jan's uh, uh, slides up, I think, you know, one of the, I think those are great framing questions, timing, funding, innovation, certainly add to the list, you know, planning, right? Whose responsibility is it to plan and think about some of these things? Um, so those are questions I think the rest of our uh, speakers will, uh, uh, will also.
also address. So I uh, just want to welcome Jan Vrins from Navigant to talk a little bit about um, how we're really dealing with these issues of sustainability and resilience on the car while it's running, right? Uh, the electric power sector is something that's shifting pretty dramatically. We focused on it in other sessions here. Uh, so uh, take it away, Jan. Thanks, Sarah. Um, also excited to be here uh, talking about this topic. Uh, I think Peter covered a lot of ground. Um, I will talk about two um, macro technology trends that we see around energy infrastructure. Uh, technology never stands by itself. Uh, uh, regulation, people, processes, organization, business models, market structures are part of it. Um, but we see two big technology trends happening now in the energy infrastructure space that uh, can become game, game changers. Um, to start, um, and, and Peter spoke about that, global um, um, urbanization, these are some some numbers in terms of what's going to happen over the next 35 years. Where currently 50% of the world population lives in cities, that will increase to 70%. Uh, it, will, it, will go, uh, it will rise up to 6.3 billion people living in cities in 2050, using 70% of um, uh, the world's energy use, um, only occupying 2% of the world's space. So these are some interesting numbers. Um, from an overall, you know, uh, uh, urbanization, global urbanization perspective, we classify this century as the urban century. There will be more people moving to cities uh, in the first half of this decade, uh, uh, this century, uh, uh, more than we had so far combined in human history. Um, so that's quite, quite interesting. Um, and this raises um, questions around um, sustainability. Um, resilience, uh, also affordability and cost, uh, and how do you manage uh, energy infrastructure underneath. One of the concepts, I'll talk about two concepts, smart city and energy cloud, and I will explain uh, um, energy cloud in, in a bit. Uh, smart city, I think everybody has heard about, you know, the concept of smart cities. We do believe that, um, and this is the definition of, of smart cities, it's enabled by technology, but it clearly focuses on sustainability, citizen well-being, and economic development. As Peter said, uh, you know, resilience is not part of the definition yet, so that's quite interesting. And, and the question is, should it be added? But this is, this is more or less of a common uh, definition right now. All the smart, gritty, smart city projects globally uh, hit on those three elements. Um, we see very recently, as of last year, discussions about sustainability, and can, can that be part of you know, the definition of smart cities and, and what that means. Um, but again, smart cities uh, aimed at providing uh, more convenience to uh, the people living in the city, um, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, building a cleaner uh, energy infrastructure. Uh, energy efficiency is a big component of that. Um, we strongly believe that energy efficiency is underutilized. Um, I think it will change rapidly over the next couple of years at the global level not only in North America, but specifically in Europe, and then obviously uh, the Far East uh, as well. And um, housing, street, street lighting is part of that, uh, distribution energy resources, um, energy management systems for buildings um, um, are part of you know, the smart city concept, as well as transportation, obviously, electric vehicles uh, or, or otherwise. Um, and economic development is always part of these discussions because that's the big motor behind you know, investments and what governments um, as well as uh, private organizations are trying to accomplish as part of smart city um, initiatives. So this is um, uh, smart cities. Um, the energy cloud um, is a concept that we developed where we see right now a big transformation happening in the industry from a uh, one-way power system where you had centralized power generation, uh, mostly uh, nuclear fossil fuel, some hydro here and there, uh, transmission, distribution into your house, um, you get your monthly bill, you pay the bill. If you don't pay the bill, the utility would cut you off. Um, that was pretty much, you know, the system uh, that we had uh, built so far in the last hundred years or so. To what we call the energy cloud, um, which is really evolving rapidly right now. Big players in the industry are embracing uh, uh, this concept. Um, we see uh, a lot more distributed energy resources, uh, wind, solar, and whether it's utility scale solar or rooftop solar on top of your house, uh, community solar facilities uh, uh, on campuses of universities and, and medical uh, facilities. Um, 
uh, electric vehicles, uh, charging stations, uh, using uh, car batteries to dis discharge at certain moments in time back into the grid. Um, concepts of I have rooftop solar, I generate power, uh, I generate more power than I use, I sell it back to the grid, to a community storage facility, and my neighbor who does not have a, a rooftop solar buys power from that utility um, uh, storage facility, sorry, from, sorry from, from that storage facility in the, in the neighborhood. Two-way power flows, um, consumers of power become producers uh, of power, so prosumers. A very complicated um, financial transactional um, uh, uh, relationships will appear. Uh, complex regulation, um, um, but it's happening as we speak. Um, if you look at um, renewable penetration in California, there are days now in the, uh, in the California ISO territory where at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there's less demand for power than 2 o'clock in the morning. So the traditional demand curves um, uh, that we see in the, on the left side of this picture will drastically change on the right side picture because of uh, rooftop solar, because of wind and other uh, uh, renewables and distributed energy resources. Um, storage will be a game changer once we add storage to um, solar and wind. We don't depend on the sun or you know, uh, when the wind blows anymore. We can store it and we can use it uh, whenever we need it. Uh, I was reading an article um, on my flight in um, about a new battery um, technology, uh, alumni-based, where a cell phone can be charged within one minute um, and it can um, uh, recharge more often than the traditional, even lithium, you know, battery uh, technology. So technology will come. Uh, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when uh, and when they reach, you know, grid parity and when they reach you know, uh, the point where they become economic, economically viable. I was in Dubai um, uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Um, DOR just bought a um, utility scale solar facility at six cents per kilowatt hour. Um, those are groundbreaking uh, rates for solar. Um, it will continue to go down. Um, and it's coming from Hawaii, California, Arizona. It's up in Jersey now. It's coming to Arizona, um, uh, sorry, to uh, the Georgia, uh, the Carolinas and Georgia, and ultimately in Florida where I live, which is the Sunshine State, but not very favorable for solar. But we're doing a study right now for the utility in Florida looking at distributed solar integration into the grid. Um, the, what this means for the grid is quite um, uh, um, significant uh, the grid will undergo uh, significant changes to manage all those intermittent resources, um, to understand, you know, demand of power, meet it up with supply across the entire uh, value chain. What this also does is there's multiple new players uh, developing, um, building, um, or, you know, maintaining and operating these distribution energy resources. Um, and, um, it will be very complex to manage um, because ultimately you want to manage demand and supply, but with um, clearly uh, the demand side uh, of the equation uh, uh, changing rapidly, um, uh, users generate their own power, don't rely on power from the grid anymore, at least not when the sun shines. When the sun goes down, all of a sudden I need to rely back on the grid. And then with all those intermittent resources, it's, it will be a very complex uh, entity to, to manage. And we're doing a lot of studies now and thinking about how that will work. Uh, because again, the traditional rules won't apply in this uh, energy cloud concept. By the way, energy cloud comes from, com you know, from cloud computing and you know, this whole uh, uh, um, uh, movement there, which is quite interesting. Plug and play, um, anybody can produce his own power uh, and you know, plug it into the grid, uh, basically. Um, in terms of some of the technologies, uh, underlying the energy cloud. Here are some. Um, uh, I, I spoke about storage. Uh, I spoke about distributed generation. Um, uh, so I think I covered that. The right side of this, this slide really talks about, you know, the configuration of the grid. Uh, we're going to need to have systems and applications in place to manage all these distributed energy resources, these intermittent resources. And then there's other technologies that support that. Um, uh, smart in inverters, smart uh, uh, meters, smart routers advanced SCADA, demand response, and building energy management systems. So there will be a lot of technologies layered on top of the grid 
that actually manage demand and supply uh, across uh, the grid. And that's where a lot of the investment goes to right now that the large investor-owned utilities are doing. Either they're investing in, in hardening the grid, so just moving the substation to you know, a higher altitude is, is you know, uh, our investments that are being made, uh, or putting some of the distribution cables underground uh, to, to make it more resilient. Uh, things that, are PS, you know, that PSNG is doing right now up in, uh, up in Jersey. Um, and the others are around you know, making the grid smarter to manage demand and supply more efficiently and to manage all the um, distributed energy resources that are uh, appearing. In terms of, oops, in terms of um, the combination of energy cloud, um, smart cities, and then resiliency, um, Peter spoke about that. You know, more people are moving towards large cities. There's 360 million people that are currently living in coastal areas um, that are just above 10 meter uh, of sea level. Um, very vulnerable, and this is just one element. New York City, uh, the population in New York City that is now in the flood zone doubled in the last um, you know, 30 years or so. Um, cost of Hurricane Sandy, don't need to talk about that um, uh, much. I think Peter covered that. And then the energy cloud, um, is that a good or a bad thing from a resiliency perspective? And, and there's some pros and cons here. Uh, energy cloud has built-in redundancy. Um, I have my rooftop solar facility. If that doesn't work, I go back to you know, the grid. Um, uh, microgrids uh, will provide more resiliency uh, to the grid. Um, the fact that the grid will become smarter gives higher visibility and control over demand and supply. So you, know, you can actually manage it more actively. You can see where the outages are uh, very quickly, uh, and you can restore outages uh, much quicker. Uh, PSNG is looking at technologies where they actually use their customers to take pictures of damaged infrastructure. Those pictures you know, are being sent through their mobile application into their SCADA system. It looks at the configuration of the pole, and the crew is being sent out one time to fix the damage, while in the past, the crew had to come back two or three times because they needed to look at what the damage is, they need to find the right inventory for it, uh, send out the crew to repair it, et cetera, et cetera. So it will help in terms of you know, restoring quicker and improving overall uh, resiliency. And then customer choice and, and reduction of dependency where I don't want to rely on my utility for my power, I'm going to generate my own power, is something that is also on the left side of um, the pros. Cons are complexity, increased points of failure, um, which is a big issue. How do you manage all those distributed energy resources, to Peter's point? Uh, you know, Central is easier, looks easier, um, and I think my, the next speaker will talk about that a little bit more. Um, Security, definitely an issue. Um, the grid will become digitali digitalized and um, will be open for uh, security threats. Um, so that's an issue uh, that is being looked at and is debated uh, broadly. Um, and then the complexity overall of managing demand and supply is, is not easy, specifically not in a deregulated market. So it will be very interesting to see in deregulated markets like California or New York um, or Texas, where distribution resources are really taking off, um, where the number of um, entities involved in producing, um, uh, 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 transmitting, and distributing power is significantly higher than in my state, Florida, where I just have FPL, which is an integrated you know, utility. They do it all. Um, and what that does in terms of their ability to manage the, 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 the grid uh, effectively. Um, energy cloud, cloud might lead to re-regulation. Uh, in some areas, which is quite an interesting um, uh, statement, and we can, we can talk about that. Um, let's see. Uh, my last comment on this slide would be um, uh, power doesn't stand by itself. Power ties into water. Peter spoke about that. But then also public safety, uh, you know, street lighting, uh, transportation, electric vehicles, uh, emergency serv service integration, and, and all others. So that's back to the smart city. You can't look at power by itself, but power is part of a broader um, infrastructure, uh, and you need to look at all elements of that um, uh, if you want to be successful in uh, either building or rebuilding. Um, closing, Energy Cloud is here to stay. It's not going to go anywhere, uh, and smart cities will evolve and adapt. Most of the smart city projects right now are in the pilot phase, um, but they are evolving in, in broader implementations um, around energy efficiency, uh, demand-side management, uh, transportation, 
smart meters, smarter uh, equipment on the grid uh, as well. Um, resiliency will, resilience of the infrastructure, uh, as well as convenience to the citizen, I think the customer choice element will become more predominant uh, and more important as part of the discussions around smart cities and the energy cloud. Um, underlying infrastructure is changing really quickly, uh, whether it's replacement or new build, um, and key, talk, key technologies um, will continue to evolve. Um, again, storage will be a game changer, provides resiliency, um, uh, um, and, and will, you know, uh, help sustainability as well because it supports um, solar and, and wind. Uh, at the macro level, the objectives can contradict. I think at the, at the micro level, uh, we'll find solutions to make it all uh, work. And then uh, what is needed, um, and Peter spoke about that, is that uh, public-private entities, uh, government, non-government, utilities play a key role in this, uh, will have to come together um, figure out a strategy and implementation um, for a city, uh, for a state, or for a country, uh, and do some sort of a long-term, we call it integrated resource planning, um, uh, but also, uh, you know, uh, uh, a plan to build your infrastructure underneath um, cities and states and countries uh, based on energy waste, transportation, building and infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. That was great. Um, so uh, next, I'd like to invite Amos Avedon to come up, uh, Senior Vice President from Bechtel, to talk from a practitioner's perspective about doing big infrastructure projects with both sustainability and resilience in mind uh, at the planning phase and thinking about technologies that are brought to bear. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, CSSIS for bringing this panel together. I appreciate being here, and thank you for the audience for coming here and those who are joining us on uh, the webcast. Uh, I hope you find it interesting. I think one of the main reasons to talk about this, I think, is, and both David and Jan uh, and Peter mentioned this in our discussions before, is we need, we need to increase awareness of the importance of the confluence of designing for a more sustainable future and for a more resilient future. We hear a lot about sustainability. We need to hear equally about resiliency. We believe at Bechtel that they're both synergistic. We also don't believe they necessarily have to cost you more. You just have to plan for them and put them into your planning. And I'll try to show you some of that in my talk. Uh, the other thing that's important is years ago when we talked about uh, resiliency, we mostly talked about hardening of facilities. You know, you have a power plant, you build a big wall around it, so if there is a flood or something, it can protect it. And that's still important. But increasingly, what I'd like, I'd like to show you today, this is changing dramatically to some of the things you've heard from Peter and Johan about. We now live in an information age, and we look at systems. And just like reliability-centered maintenance, we're not trying to back up equipment or individual components. We want to make the whole system resilient. And that definition of resiliency is how fast can you bring it up to speed. And I'm just thinking about uh, what an area to work in. Uh, if you really plan well for resiliency, your measure of success if is, well, a big event happens and nothing much happens. So many of us feel that's maybe not enough a reward. I don't think that's the reason we are not going in as much into it, but that is truly the measure of doing it well is that nothing much happens. So we live in an information age, and that information age transforms everything we all do in our lives. We all know it. It's real. Data is truly transforming everything we do. It's a new resource. It's changing the whole world very rapidly, and you've seen smart cities make, take advantage of all that. What I'd like to show you is this, this information age is also dramatically changing how we plan, design, and build big infrastructure projects, including energy infrastructure, and how that's helping those structures not only be more sustainable and more resilient, but also transfer all this information to our customers and through a whole life cycle of that, those projects. So let me see. Uh, it's, there you are. So uh, we truly live in an information age. And we, you've heard the phrases, the internet of things. That's very real. All this construction equipment we have out there today is highly automated. It can, it can maintain itself. It knows what it's doing. It knows if it's operated in a safe manner. As a matter of fact, it can be operated remotely by people. Or the next step, it's 
can be operated by the three-dimensional model that designs the plant can actually operate equipment. So there's a dramatic revolution that we're in the middle of it. Uh, this revolution relies, of course, on satellites, GPS systems, drones increasingly, uh, uh, of course, connectivity in all ways. The three-dimensional models you're all familiar with, I'm sure, the uh, ability to plan in real time. And then increasingly, mobility. When we think of the construction workforce that we are seeing now and it's what it's being changed into, it, these are people with highly sophisticated mobility tools. There's fewer of them, but they can do much more. And they have access to real information, not to paper drawings. The big difference here is we, you know, we lived in a document age. We were designing in a 3D world, but communicating in a 2D world. And we want to get rid of all of that. We want to move to a data-centric, world. We call it virtual project delivery. And I'll, ex I'll show you a couple of examples of how this actually works. We are right at the edge of it. This is a true revolution. This is a bigger revolution in our world and in engineering and construction than the introduction of computer was compared to drafting tables and, and uh, slide rules. I look at my audience and I know more than half of them have no clue what I've just said. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the, uh, this is a truly game changing. And the opportunity here is to deliver much better project. What I mean by that is to plan for these projects to be sustainable, to be resilient, to be lower cost, faster schedule with less resources, and very important to the fact, you know, when you look at all this infrastructure that my colleagues talks about, we're talking about trillions of dollars. To be able to commit to those levels of investment, especially by private investors and by partnerships, you need predictability of these big capital projects. Every now and then you hear of capital projects that greatly exceed uh, what was promised, and those tools can really help you with much better predictability. So, let's see, I guess you have to press it like you mean it. Oh, this one. So here's an example of how we use, uh, how we design a smart city. But this can apply to anything. This happens to be an example for uh, basically redoing the whole planning for the infrastructure of a whole country, Gabon, and the city of Liberville that's being transformed through, into a smart city through this process. Uh, and, and what you can see through here is there's different layers of information. We start with GIS information. GIS is more than just maps. Uh, it's, it's very sophisticated maps that have a lot of information embedded in them about everything that is important to the design of that. Uh, element. Uh, above that you have a lot of information about what's already in the ground. We need to be obviously for safety security reasons and for knowing the underground layouts and there's more and more ways to get this information and transform it to real data. Above it you have the whole grid of roads and public transport and communication systems that drive a, a, any kind of city, smart city or one of the more old-fashioned ones that's being transformed to a smart city. And above that, of course, you have the interaction of people, where they live, businesses, and how that city works. And then above it, you have everything else, the, the infrastructure, the energy infrastructure. Energy, as my colleague said, drives everything in, in today's world, and the communication channels. So this is, can be done from scratch. This is being done to improve existing systems. And this is really what's changing the whole work process. And this work process is illustrated there on the chart it's for, it's for planning, for engineering, for pro the global supply chain, which today is truly a global supply chain, for construction, which as I said is more automated and using sophisticated information-driven tools, down to starting up those facilities safely, transferring them to the owners. So the big difference here is instead of transferring a whole book of documents, and there's many books in those big projects, it's transferring the whole data that was gathered to build and design it as the operating data for the customer. That makes a huge difference for the safe and quick ability of those, the owners of energy facilities, to operate them quickly, safely, and reliably. And then, of course, it looks at the life cycle, and that's where sustainability comes in in a big way, and that it looks all the way through decommissioning of these facilities. What does it mean? And all, th these, as I said, these systems are here today, they're being used, but we're just beginning to see the benefits of, of these systems, and, and there's a long way to come to, to really fully utilize and take advantage of these benefits. So let me show you a few examples. Uh, just collected some pictures here of some of the projects we are working on. So uh, on the left, nuclear energy. 
Uh, nuclear power plants are there. Their lives are being extended. Of course, this is a local issue. In different countries, people look at nuclear energy differently. From one aspect, of course, it's a major part of the solution of the greenhouse gas, gas reduction issue. It's, there's a lot of construction of new plants. There's also new technology being developed to uh, lower the costs of nuclear energy. But the key with nuclear energy, of course, is that it has to be very reliable, very safe, and very resilient. And th that is something that, that is going on. The lessons are being learned. If you look at uh, these uh, incidents like the Fukushima Daiichi, yes, there are issues of hardening infrastructure, as I said, against natural disasters. But there's also, how do you quickly recover? How do you provide immediately power so pumps can pump water out of it quickly? How do you make sure all that recovery resilient infrastructure is in place? And that's something that people are looking at today. The other one, of course, the big story, uh, as, as was just mentioned, shale gas and, and the lower price of natural gas and the fact that the resources of natural gas would last us uh, more than this whole century is, is really there in the, in, the, in the middle picture on the top. You see one of the modern natural gas power plants. They're being built everywhere, certainly in the US. They are a great match for renewable energy like solar and wind. They, they have great synergy between them. And the costs of planning for these facilities to be resilient and sustainable has come down dramatically with this kind of approach that I described as virtual project delivery approach. So for example, when we build an, a, one of these combined cycle power plants, like the one we're just building not too far from here in Virginia, it's a copy of a template that was built before, designed, has all the information in it, and the amount of engineering you need for a plant like that is less than 20% of what it would take to design a plant from scratch. That's a major impact, and that's why I, I have this belief that these technologies and all this don't have to add costs. On the contrary, we should look at them all as opportunities to lower cost. Uh, there's also, you know, we, we, like many others, believe in all of the above. Resiliency is also diversity of supply, and so we are involved in hydropower, in uh, solar power. We built one of the largest concentrating solar facilities in Ivanpah that's shown in the, in the diagram. And as mentioned, the cost of uh, PV power is coming down dramatically to the point that it's truly competitive. It's a game changer. All of these plants, by the way, use exactly the same approach that I showed for Smart City for their design and operations and maintenance. And of course, I just would like to finish on this one with liquefied natural gas. Liquefied natural gas, again, is a major business worldwide. It's bringing natural gas everywhere. And these facilities have an outstanding record of resiliency, sustainability, and just people feel comfortable that they would run for decades as they are. And now, surprisingly, we all would, we wouldn't have believed it several years ago, but we are building some of the largest facilities of that kind in the United States. We're gonna become a major natural gas exporter. So the paradigms do shift, but the technologies really uh, uh, is what's driving them just as it is for shale gas. Uh, just one couple of quick examples here. Uh, Crossrail. Crossrail is a major rail dig across London. It's a, one of the biggest changes in London's infrastructure since the Victorian age where all the train stations were built on the periphery and there's limited connectivity east-west. So this is a dramatic change in all of London and, and this was specifically designed for sustainability, for resiliency, for scenarios of what happens if sea levels rise, temperature rise, uh, people's mobility patterns change. This was all taken into account and in terms of sustainability, the, uh, we are working on this with an integrated team with the owners, the Transport for London. Uh, they wanted to lower greenhouse gas emissions throughout the life cycle of this project. And uh, surprisingly, 15% of the greenhouse gas emissions from 120 years of operation are in the construction phase. So we may put a dramatic effort to lower uh, those uh, greenhouse gas emissions. For example, using uh, diesel hybrid uh, construction equipment, uh, much, much more efficient tunnel boring machines, uh, LED lights, so you need less of them and less cables, uh, dimming lights automatically. All this information technology, the internet of things is allowing you to do all that. This is not cost increasing. This is actually decreasing the cost and doing good for the planet. So this is very important to note on, on Crossrail. And this is again happening in rail systems around the world. And it can also be used to retrofit all the rail systems to those kind of standards. And my last example is again going back to Gabon and the master uh, plan for that country because that to me is a great development model for the developing world is to, they, just like with uh, cell phones, many countries that never had landlines moved to cell phone technology. 
there's an opportunity for the developing world to leapfrog a lot of this and design smart and resilient infrastructure. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Avdan. That was wonderful. Uh, last but not least, David Rogers, come to talk, talk about the work that Jeff's doing in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> how much time do we have? Okay, okay, very good. Um, thank you, everybody. It's good to see some uh, friendly faces here, and thanks to Sarah and uh, Peter uh, for uh, building this uh, panel discussion and focusing on this very important topic. Um, the Global Environment Facility, it's been around since 1991. It's the largest public funder for environmental projects in developing countries. Uh, Japan is our biggest donor. Uh, but the U.S. is our second biggest donor. And, you know, we're talking about urban, and so let me focus some of our, uh, my ta uh, talks on what we've done in the urban sector. We've been doing urban projects since 1999, more than 100 projects in 60 countries, investing um, more than 600 million. Now, it's true, most of that investment focused on sustainability. And I think uh, that gets to the feature that Peter is uh, discussing, is how can we move beyond that and integrate resilience into sustainability? Here's a couple of examples, though, where we've been able to do some of both. So in Tianjin, uh, a uh, investment we did in China, they uh, focused on use, uh, using the land better, developing a transit-oriented uh, land use planner, planning uh, system and adopting a, a vegetation and water network to be more resilient. And this has ended up being a very effective uh, a test case uh, for a city with 12 million people, but uh, has been a role model for other Chinese cities that are going through rapid development. And again, some of the features here included an integrated urban plan that focused on uh, regulatory and policy development, uh, energy efficiency in public buildings, as has been mentioned, and uh, public transport uh, systems and non-motorized transport modes. Now, here's another example in a rapidly developing uh, uh, city in Cameroon. Uh, this is a city of two and a half million people, and their um, challenge was primarily adapting to uh, weather-related events, including flooding. And so here we uh, helped promote community-based adaptation measures with larger-scale investments in flood risk management, water, and sanitation. And I think one of the aspects of this that gets to the uh, points our uh, speakers mentioned was that um, uh, energy, and we, we can reduce energy consumption and wastewater treatment while also making that treatment system more resilient in case of floods. So these are um, a win-win if you have the right engineering uh, and uh, the right perspective going into that. So I made a short list, uh, I think sort of repeating some of what my colleagues already said, but from our experience, we have seen uh, a lot of work on sustainable cities. We've seen a lot of work on sustainable energy. And I'd like to see those come together in a future sustainable energy uh, resilient city. So I think from our experience, uh, we do want to reinforce that you have to rely on and reinforce and strengthen the natural systems that led to the founding of the city in the first place, and how can you take advantage of those rather than try to reverse engineer or re geoengineer them. And I'm thinking, for example, right now in Los Angeles, there's a very nice development project to restore the LA River, which is gonna be nice for recreation and for green and for sustainability. Well, that, the original uh, engineering on that was to protect against floods, flash floods. So what if 20, 40, 50 years ago they could have had the foresight that we now know and could have built a resilient system from the beginning that promoted uh, natural systems for that city? And they can get there again, but it's going to be much more expensive now uh, than it would have been before. And I think as Peter mentioned, an energy resilient city is going to know where its water is and it's going to be able to manage water 
before a shock event, during, and then uh, after uh, a shock event. And energy and water, I think, to this audience, there's probably no need to repeat, but in most uh, folks' mind, very, very uh, critically linked. And it would be a crime, really, to build a, uh, a, a power plant now and not know where your water is going to come from for decades down the future. But unfortunately, uh, unless the uh, folks hire Bechtel, they might, not, uh, they might not think those things through, but they need to. So we absolutely have to know where the water is going to be during these shock events. Is it going to um, ruin all the uh, uh, nice energy efficient equipment on the, the sub-basement floor? in your building, or have you thought ahead and have you moved that to a higher floor in the building? My favorite uh, topic for an energy resilient city, echoes on one of my, my, my fellow speakers, is that you need to prioritize energy efficiency in buildings and equipment. You're going to not only lower peak demand, which allows you to deliver energy to the community um, uh, through peak events, through shock events, um, you're, we're going to take advantage of better windows, advanced glazing to help moderate climate variations and protect against severe weather. And that's got to be done through either your insurance company is going to make you buy that, or it's going to be building codes and politicians are going to make you buy it. But someone needs to make sure that those type of advanced windows are in all of buildings going forward. I do think, as uh, our speakers mentioned, that a resilient city has diverse sources of energy supply and hopefully storage, and that when they can build out a distributed or self-reliant installations that can become a backbone in a, in a shock event, like the hospitals that had their backup generators running, became um, a resilient, uh, safe place for first responders in Hurricane Sandy. But you can plan ahead on that so that you have a network of resilient, uh, uh, self-reliant installations that in good times are connected to the cost-effective grid and in the bad times can become uh, islands of uh, reliance and, and uh, resiliency. And I think as most of our speakers already mentioned, uh, uh, resiliency is going to build uh, information and communication technology a system that allows data collection, dynamic controls, allows decision makers to be able to improve operations on a uh, regular basis and then respond uh, appropriately when there are uh, events. And I do think in our examples, many of the sustainable cities that um, we like to fund are also thinking about transportation alternatives that give added resiliency in the case of a shock event. So public transport, human-based human transportation options, multiple uh, avenues, and good uh, urban planning are going to give you resiliency in your transportation system. Now I have just a couple of things that uh, I wanted to uh, let you know as sort of an advertisement. Um, if you are working with developing country partners or would like to, the Jeff has about $200 million to invest in uh, low emission urban systems in the next three years. And this can be oriented on transit, uh, energy efficiency, distributed uh, energy systems, municipal waste systems. And we have another approach, which is our Sustainable Cities Integrated Approach Pilot, which is asking um, uh, cities to take a very long range plan to their uh, um, uh, d sustainable cities uh, design and look beyond just climate and not just water, not just uh, uh, chemicals, not just waste, but to try to look at things in an integrated fashion across the board. So in our sustainable cities, and uh, this competition has been open now for um, about six months, each of the participating cities uh, that's being selected is going to develop a sustainability plan and have a common set of tools that are informed by uh, uh, Rockefeller Foundation, World Resources Institute, uh, ICLEI, R R20, C40, et cetera, because this will be a very collaborative uh, approach. I I'm, I'm going fast to leave time for questions. I apologize, slow me down. But 
We have tentatively selected uh, 11 cities, uh, uh, countries, I'm sorry, with multiple cities that will be a part of the program ranging across the world. Uh, and these uh, cities have offered to put in their own resources. You can see some of the numbers there. Uh, for example, in, um, in Mexico, uh, they'll be finding 110 million of resources to match with 15 million of, of Jeff funding. Uh, and we expect many of these programs to, uh, over the next five years, to develop very um, um, proactive investments in sustainable sitting planning, and the opportunity to engage with them on resiliency is very high. We do also see that this integrated approach pilot should help establish st sustainable urban management um, as, a, as a leading effort in the next several years. It's a very crowded space. Uh, the Jeff is not trying to reinvent the wheel, but to trying to facilitate people coming together in this uh, effort. Now, um, my colleague Xiaomei Tan couldn't be with us today, but I know she's very interested in talking to you about our Sustainable Cities effort. So let me just conclude with uh, 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 several thoughts. That, okay. Um, number one, uh, we need to move beyond little pilot demonstrations. I think clearly we have the technologies now, we have the experience, and so for a sustainable energy resilient city of the future, we need proposals that can get to scale, that, that can look at the entire city and protect the entire population. And I encourage uh, folks to think about not uh, a little demo here or a little pilot here, but a large scale transformative investment. And I think uh, the, what Peter mentioned about the timing of investments is so critical. And I think it calls on us, those of us who are involved in the international financial institutions, the World Banks and the Asian Development Banks and others, to rethink the way we deliver investment. Because right now, they can only deliver investment either five years ahead of an event or in a crisis, uh, but we do not have the ability to help uh, invest um, at all the times in, uh, after a shock event to encourage uh, resiliency. I do think Peter's point about trade-offs is uh, very important to understand, but I, I like the way that uh, Amos uh, re reframed it, is that in many cases, a low-cost, resilient, sustainable decision is actually a low-cost solution if you can get away from legacy thinking about the way things have been done in the past. And I, I think as well, if there's one challenge I would make to the panel and to those in the audience is that the intellectual understanding of resiliency is a critical step, and I think we've reached that. But the political understanding of the benefits of resiliency is another critical step. Which politician is going to get rewarded because they proactively thought ahead and invested in resiliency and then created the non-event that Amos was talking about, uh, right? And I think unless we figure that out, uh, we're going to struggle and it may be that uh, businesses will be in the lead because they will use bottom line reasoning to make these uh, proactive investments. But if, unless we can also educate politicians to support these type of investments, we will be shortchanging ourselves. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Okay, well we've got about 15 minutes left uh, for discussion, but uh, I just thought I'd make everybody aware in a, in a funny, not haha -ha funny, but eerie funny uh, kind of way, there's a big power outage uh, throughout DC right now. <laughs> so uh, so we picked a good day for our resilience uh, conversation to be had. So I don't think it's anything terribly serious, but there's a lot of places, including, I guess, the White House, the State Department, don't have power right now. So we're lucky. We, we planned it this way. We're resilient here. <laughs> and, and in approximately 30 seconds, the lights are going to turn off. <laughs> Um, listen, I want to open up the, uh, we, since we have limited amount of time, I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. If you're not forthcoming, I have lots of them. So uh, please raise your hand, state your name and affiliation, and uh, put your question in the form of a question. Wait for the microphone because uh, the, uh, we're webcasting. So we'll start right here in the aisle. Mariah, go ahead. And maybe what I'll do is like take 
take two or three questions and then we'll take them as a group, please. Yeah, hi, Dave Ramaswamy with Africa Agribusiness Magazine. My question is a kind of follow up to what David said about the political system being trained or re-paradigmed to think long term. My question is how do you get the financial system or financial funding organizations which are focused on efficiency mm -hmm. to think about resiliency and how do you get pension fund and foundation capital into investing in energy assets? Okay. And the second follow up question is in emerging markets where you're all the new urbanization is happening, how do you deliver appropriate energy technologies to ensure sustainability and resiliency? Simple example, you know, a lot of cities in Africa and India over the last 20 years have cut down trees. And now, 20 years later, air conditioners need to run all the time, which take out the grid. So how do you balance, like, smart technologies with cheap technology? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Andy Reynolds. I work at the Department of State. And urbanization is in our wheelhouse, everyone. Ha looking to Habitat 3, all that the United Nations is doing in transitioning between MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, and Sustainable Development Goals. But my question is to the whole panel. Uh, it was a very interesting, complex storyline, but I didn't hear much about demand size management in the smart cities concept. And I m maybe Amos Evidin can particularly talk to that on the front lines. Moreover, in the urbanization challenge, we're talking about a billion people already living in slums. And by 2030, it's going to be two billion people living in slums. And the economic momentum and development momentum of the world is not going to change that trajectory. So how do we address the slums and the minimal infrastructure under current slums and growing slums before we talk about shining cities on the hill? I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, what is being done to try and use the internet to get together the people who want to fund these things and get an economic consensus of them? Okay. Anybody want to take uh, any one of or a, a group of those questions? Uh, I will take this so last polite. Second. about that. Um, I'll take the demand side management one. I, I mentioned it briefly. We believe that um, demand side management and demand response uh, will be a key part of um, uh, where the industry is evolving towards smart cities, the energy cloud, uh, however you want to call it. Um, we've actually made some, some decent uh, uh, um, progress here in, uh, in, in North America. I think uh, there's a lot of work to be done in Europe, and there's EU uh, guidelines that recently, well, recently, late last year came out. Uh, there's the whole EPA 111D discussion here where, you know, one of the pillars is, is demand side management and demand response. Um, we, we follow discussions where, you know, demand side management and demand response um, uh, would actually be uh, considered another resource. Do I build a plant or do I run programs to manage demand and reduce overall uh, demand and put a return on it. I mean, you know, Rolf Iso from PSCNG has been very vocal about uh, uh, the fact that the government and the regulators should actually put a return on investment on demand side management and demand response programs. So uh, we believe it's the start, uh, it's the way, it, it's the point to start. Um, at the same time, um, you will need, um, an infrastructure that can actually support that if you want to do it, you know, really effectively. I mean, you can change light bulbs. Um, that's one thing, and it helps, you know, 25, 30 percent of savings on, you know, energy usage for a building. Um, but it really becomes interesting if you talk about smart city lighting, um, where you have smart devices that know when city lights need to be turned on and off. Uh, also, you know, uh, looking at from a security perspective. So I think there's a still a lot of, you know, um, uh, technology advancement that is possible to even go beyond just changing light bulbs. Uh, sir, I'd like also to address the question of uh, uh, energy uh, demand, the demand side of it, and people living in urban centers and in sl increasingly in slums. I think that's a very important aspect of it. So first of all, in, the, in terms of energy, uh, we talked about energy as all of the above. And one thing we, I think we many agree on, uh, I certainly think so, is that 
we are not short on resources. We are not running out of uranium or natural gas or hydrocarbons or anything else, or despite occasional, you know, the peak oil or peak coal or peak solar energy. Or, uh, we are really not running out of resources. The problem is never the resource. The problem is the planning, how to make it sustainable, how to lower greenhouse gas emissions, which is a big part of sustainability. And especially important when you talk about urbanization is, uh, although energy is growing much faster than almost anything else in real terms, uh, when people move more into smart cities, energy consumption per capita actually decreases and greenhouse gas emissions decrease. But when we go from 7 billion people to 9 billion people and more and more of these people expect to, their expectations rise and they will live a better lifestyle and those who live in slums certainly want to get out of that kind of existence, that does drive the need for energy. But that other than resilience that we talked about and sustainability and the fact that you don't have to worry about that there's plenty of it out there. It's again that old overused adage that the stone age didn't end because of the lack of stones. So we're, the hydrocarbon age and the current energy age is not gonna end because of lack of resource. But delivering them smartly also, that last element in this is delivering them economically. And the technologies exist today to do it. And that's one of the biggest factors that can improve the quality of life for people around the world is deliver, delivering reliable, resilient, sustainable, and lower cost energy. That to me is a main driver. Yeah, I just mentioned uh, an interesting trend and that is you see mayors appointing chief resilience officers um, around the world. So that, um, as you know, you said, that there's a lot of education that needs to be done, but these shock events, I think, have woken up um, those that are responsible for these important urban centers. And if actually, if you look around the world, it's, it's actually cities that are the key elements in generating GDP. It's not the country, it's actually the cities. So the cities are actually important engines of economic growth. And those engines, um, if the shock events sh you know, send them into off the rails, um, it has lots of repercussions. So I think um, there is a growing number of uh, mayors. And, and if you look at the conferences that the mayors and, the, and others in this space um, are attending and the topics that they're speaking about, you're seeing the resilience definitely rise to the occasion, uh, rising up the agenda, and that is leading to a lot of thinking about how do we deal with the financing issues, how do we create the right uh, incentive structures. And on the private sector, um, there have been a number of instances in which uh, supply chains have been dramatically disrupted, and so companies are thinking about where do we invest, and that has, I think, an interesting set of repercussions and incentives for those cities that don't invest in resilience. They they may not get the next wave of uh, investment. So hopefully that leads to a, a positive uh, outcome where we see cities taking this seriously and investing it so that they continue to build um, those kinds of uh, resilient cities that we're seeking. Well, thank you for the questions. Um, regarding financial investments, uh, I think um, in the development community, the holy grail is to somehow unlock the massive um, uh, flows of financial capital that are sitting in CalPERS and uh, Dutch, uh, uh, Danish pension funds, et cetera, and have that steered toward clean, sustainable development. Well, a couple of the things that seem to be necessary to help make that happen are a good, predictable return, risk-adjusted, and a strong project pipeline. Well, I think uh, there's a lot of money out there that's uh, made itself available for good returns in green bonds, et cetera, et cetera, but the project pipeline has not responded yet sufficiently. So uh, one of the big important things is to create key uh, projects that are investable and bankable in cities that, uh, that foster sustainability and resiliency. One area that we're working on with the World Bank um, is the international lighting if uh, efficiency facility, which will help cities attract financing for installing energy efficient LED street lighting. And uh, as you know, these systems are uh, very cost effective, uh, very reliable, uh, dynamic controls, um, easy to install, uh, low maintenance, but the upfront capital investment is a barrier for many cities which have poor credit ratings. So this facility, in this case, it's just one slice of this very big apple. 
is designed to pool cities' funds so that uh, they can attract a better rate and, and attract large investments from the uh, financial flows. So it's one idea. Uh, I think it's very important to focus on additional project pipeline development so that uh, we can help our uh, pension funds find and invest in these large-scale sustainable uh, projects. So we have just a couple of minutes left. It will go to Bill right there. And then we'll try and take one more question you on the aisle there. Okay. Bill Eichard, uh, independent consultant. Jan, I think principally for you, you made a brief comment earlier about the possibility of needing to re-regulate in some areas. <clears throat> in the context, I, I have a feeling I know where you were going with that, but you know, my, my question would be, so 30 years ago in the regulatory systems, you know, you'd build in redundancy by the, the, the PUC or the, you know, would, would, would say, build X, this percentage excess capacity and the ratepayer would pay. So fast forward 30 years and the debate now is around things like feed-in tariffs and you know who pays what rate and, and that sort of thing. So I, I'm interested in you unpacking your comment a little bit and maybe others commenting on the state of the regulatory debate about who pays for the resiliency and the redundancy. Um, if, if I knew the answer, that would be, uh, that would be great. No, I, I, there's a lot of debate happening right now uh, around feed-in tariffs, rate structures, um, um, around the distributed energy resources um, that are, you know, becoming a bigger part of uh, of energy supply. Um, I don't know the answer. Um, what I what I do know is that um, certain countries and certain states um, have made it themselves really complex uh, in terms of uh, uh, regulation. Um, and it's, uh, you almost want to take a white sheet of paper and, and start again. Um, but I think that type of thinking is needed um, to, um, uh, to get a breakthrough because I think the, the whole foundation of the regulation built up over, over the years and even, even deregulation, right? And, and deregulation, let, let's be honest, in the beginning it really didn't work well. Um, uh, you know, it, it was intended to increase competition and improve service to, our, to, to customers. Well, it, it really didn't need a one of them. Um, uh, uh, California has the highest rates uh, of, of the country. Um, Texas, you know, in the first three years of deregulation, every single customer switched five or six times in, in, in the first three years. So, um, again, in the distribution energy resources world, um, you can debate um, um, having a highly deregulated um, environment, um, how manageable the, um, uh, the whole entity is of demand and supply. So um, I think simplification, I think um, uh, even to provoke the discussion, white sheet of paper, uh, how would we do it? Uh, not looking at what we have right now or how the regulation was built up over the years, but how would we do it in this more distributed environment uh, where, again, uh, you have different relationships, you know. Rate payers becoming producers of, of power. It, I mean, all these paradigm shifts are, are, are significant, and I think if people start, continue to pile on, on, you know, how it was in the past and how regulation was built up, I think the solutions will take, you know, significant time. Um, so I would say, you know, just for the, for the argument's sake, um, uh, design it with, you know, the future in mind. Uh, San Francisco, um, will be 100% renewable sometime this century. It will happen, and it will be 100% renewable sometime this, this century. And a century is not that long. Uh, you know, it's, it's only 85 years uh, from now. Um, but they will, they, will hit high, they will hit high percentages of renewables and distributed energy resources uh, uh, really soon. Uh, and I think the, the, the regulation needs to be um, uh, adjusted uh, significantly as the way the grid is being operated and the different players in that, in that space. Uh, don't know the answer, uh, simplification, um, build your regulation with um, the end state in mind versus on top of what we have now. That would be my advice. Uh, we're just about out of time, but I did want to ask one more sort of parting question. Dr. Avedon, you had described sort of the ability to deliver some of these projects, you know, uh, um, that were sustainable and resilient and uh, cost effective and even, you know, uh, more on time than, than in the past with some of these methods. Why, why wouldn't anyone do that, right? What, 
why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> because there have got to be people who choose not to incorporate, you know, all of the sort of, you know, most sustainable, mm -hmm. most resilient systems. What, what's the biggest barrier from a practitioner's perspective? No, I, I'd like to believe that everybody would like to do it. If they are, you know, everybody's educated to the possibilities today. There is a very fast rate of change. So I think it does take time sometimes, as we talked about, for example, the awareness of resiliency is an equally important and sometimes synergistic component. It's always been there, but the awareness of it hasn't caught up. Now it is, uh, partly due to the events mentioned by my colleagues like Superstorm Sandy and others. So I, I think that this is part of why we do these kind of meetings and what, what the work you do here is to, to increase awareness. To We'd like a sophisticated customer to say, I've heard about this, I'm, I, that's what I'd like deliver this to me. And we'd like it to be equally private investors and cities and governments and developing world everywhere to just simply raise their standards of what they're asking for, knowing that it is possible if you plan for it. Well, listen, we'd, we'd like to get people out on time. I just want to say a big thank you to Peter and Jan and Amos and, and David for being with us. I also want to say thanks to Tam and Anna and Lisa and the whole energy team. Uh, here at CSIS uh, for helping put this together. We'll be doing more uh, conversations on electricity and transition, and I hope uh, uh, there will certainly be other focused uh, events on the Global Sustainability Series, so please stay tuned. Thanks very much, and join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you.